That's right. <laughs> So as we're sitting down, I want you to remember this week, this week Satan's going to try to discourage you this week, lie to you, harass you, but let what we just did keep you in truth, keep you in love, keep you in encouragement. I also want to make a quick announcement. For the month of March, we're going to have a, a series of very important lessons and I want to encourage you to attend for the rest of the month and maybe even the first week of April related to our uh, next topic but to, to kick that next topic off and it's a really important one for the future of our congregation I want to encourage you to come next week because uh, Walt McIntyre is going to be our guest speaker next Sunday so I want to encourage you to come to you can call that <laughs> Uh, so, so I want to. I don't know if that's a clap for him or a clap for not me. <laughs> win win. <laughs> Walt's my hero. We we were talking all the time, but I'm really looking forward to it. And so I want to encourage you to be here next Sunday because it's a very very important lesson. And he was the one that me and the elders thought would be the perfect person to kind of help us in this next uh, phase of our congregation in the direction of where we're going. And so I want to just encourage you with that. Now over the last few weeks, we, we spent some time talking about the relationship of the Godhead and the Bible. We talked about God the Father, we talked about Jesus the Son and the Holy Spirit and their relationship to the Bible and how you really can't separate the Word of God apart from either of those personalities of God. Because it came from the inner being of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. But one of the things that we understand here is that God created a people. A people to be holy as He is holy. And so in order to save humanity, in order to mature the saints, in order for His will to be done, He established the church and gave the church His Word. You know, when I... As part of my work, one of my things that I do and I have to do is I have to look towards the future of the church, the future of saving people, the future of where culture is going and how we can help spread the gospel in a way that will be effective yet biblical in a, to reach people. And so every week, one of the things that I do is I think about the faces of all of our college students, and I think about the faces of our teenagers, and I think of the faces of our children, and then I ask myself, how are we going to help them be faithful in Christ? Because if I asked you, what is most important to you in your life right now, you would say, my kids, my grandkids, of course. And then I would say, well, what do you think about spiritually? And you'd say, more than anything, I want to see my kids and my grandkids have the best chance at going to heaven. So whatever we need to do, whatever path we need to take, whatever we need to do to listen to the voice and the prophetic word of God in order to help us to go in a direction that will give us the best opportunity to save our kids and our grandkids, to reach our lost community, for our families to be faithful, and even to help ourselves to remain faithful, we have to ask well, what do we need to do? Which direction do we need to go? And one of the things that I consistently, and I fully believe this, is that we constantly need to, with every generation, try to push each generation closer and closer to the Word of God. More fervency for the Word of God. And you may say, well, why? You know, over the last, if you look at human history, and when you look at the history of the church, the church was always more evangelistic, was more effective, shaped culture, kept faithful families, when the church was firm in the Word of God. When we look at the times when the church was most active in planting churches and reaching out the lost, they, you look at one of the characteristics of those generations that were good at it, they were people of the Word and they knew their Word. 
You know, people used to look at people in our fellowship in the churches of Christ, they'd be like, you know what, any one of those members knows as much of the Bible as our pastor does. And that used to be our history. Yep. And guess what? We were strong. And, and then you look at church history, and I'm a big church history person, every time the church shrunk down, Every time the church weakened, any time you saw an exodus of people leaving Christ was when people started abandoning the word of God. Amen. And one of the things that we need to be fervent in is we need to be ones who are committed to following God's word no matter how unpopular it is. Because the word of God will be unpopular. Because it was so powerful that, and so amazing you know, even the most perfect person on earth who preached this, these words were himself hated. But you know, as the church, we want to be a people that says we would rather stand with God and be judged by the world rather than stand with the world and be judged by God. And one of the things that we need to do is we need to have this fervent love for God's word again. Why? Not just because we love the Bible, but because we love God. And the best way that I can love my family, the best way I can love the church, the best way I can love the lost guy in that neighborhood right over there is for me to get into this book so I can know him better, so that I can share him better with other people. And when I, we're shaped by the Word of God, and when we're shaped as a church, then we will be ones that are firm and strong. All the great divisions in church history happened when people left the church, I mean, and the Bible. When all these different things, when people started saying, you know, the Bible doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't matter if we know it. It doesn't matter if we live it. As long as we all just sing Kumbaya, that's not true. And one of the things that we need to do is get back to this because God who loves us, we know his character, we emphasized that the last few weeks, he is more concerned about your salvation, your kids' salvation, than anyone else. And so what he did was the thing that was most powerful, and that was to give us his son, his church, and his word. If we look at the future of the, of, um, you know, I talk with a lot of people, and, and even in our own congregation, people say, I, I kind of worry about the direction of the world. Do you know how to change the world? Jesus Christ. Because he is more powerful than any nuke, any law, anything. Do we honestly believe that? What's going to shape the heart and the morals and the character of your children? We have to get back to the Word of God. And when God's people will say, I stand with the Word of God, I will stand firm in it, and I will live it, and I will love it, and I will know Him, that changes everything. Churches die usually because people leave the Bible. Let me just tell you that right now. But the ones who God always leaves as a remnant, no matter how big or small the church is, are those who are firm on the Word of God. That's an undeniable fact. Look from Genesis to Revelation. See the ones who remained faithful to God. And it was always the ones who kept to the Word. That's a, undis that's a, a fact. You read from the time of the establishment of the church till now and look at human history and see the remnant of the faithful few. And what was the, one of the key characteristics they always had? They were firm on the word of God. And did you notice every, every revival in the Christian history, whether it's the Reformation or the Restoration Movement or the Great Awakening, one of the key attributes was a return to the Word of God. How are we going to have a new awakening, a new restoration, a new reformation? It's when we decide as a church to return back to the Word of God and be unapologetic about it. Because we're not ashamed of Jesus or His gospel. Now when God's church will be firm in this, it gives us a chance to change the world and to save our families. To shape them. Because I can tell you right now, this world is teaching your kids things that are not from this book. And look at culture. Do you think it's following the word? Or do you think it's following man? 
And this is why if we love people, we have to love God. And we know that because God loves us, he spoke to us. So we don't share what we think or feel. We share what God thinks and feels. And that's just how we know. And when we draw close to God, that, that causes us to say, I want to hear your word even more than I ever have before. <clears throat> when the church will love the word of God like this again, We'll see a spiritual arising and change even in our own church, in our own lives. You know, I think about the, this group of Koreans <coughs> that, that was sent off. And one of the things that they decided to do was they decided to go into terrorist uh, territory in the Middle East. And so they said, we're going to bring some medical missions. We're going to go and bring the Word of God because if, we're, if anything's going to change people... It's going to be the Word of God. And so what they did was they went into the Middle East, and of course, they went to the dangerous part. They got kidnapped by terrorists. And so when they were there, they were all, there was about 20-some people, <coughs> and, and they were all split up. But, and they were just kidnapped. But one thing that they were able to smuggle was one Bible. They were able to smuggle one Bible. So do you know what they did? They took this Bible and they chopped it up into 20-some different pieces. And they gave each person a section of this. And then when they were sent into their own individual cells, they just spent time reading that word, reading the word, knowing Christ better and deeper than they had ever done. And then when they would assemble together, they would take their section of the Bible and they'd give it to someone else. And then they would take a new part and they would just consume it and read it and read it. Eventually, the Korean government was able to set them free. And so they came home. But what was interesting, about a year later, this group got together and they said, do you know what's weird? I wish I was still in bondage by the terrorists in my cell. Because I was closer to God than I had ever been before because all I had to eat literally, I mean not literally but figuratively, was the word of God. And I had never experienced that before because I've never experienced the Word of God like that ever in my life. And I kind of think, you know, I don't want us all to be in cells by terrorists, but what if we each had that kind of heart and character and that desire so much so where we're just consuming it and then we're passing on to each other and we're just saying, I am closer to God than I had ever been in my life. You want to know how the church grew? You know how all those people in Arkansas sent people all over America to plant churches during the Great Depression times? It's because they were people of the book. Church. The first century church were people of the book. We, in the 21st century, if we're a people of the book, why do we not think that what God did in the past, He wouldn't do now? What government has ever stopped God in His Word? Who has ever been able to silence the mouth of God? Will we suffer for it? Yeah. Will we be persecuted? Yeah. Would it maybe even someday be illegal to preach the things we're preaching? Well, I may be the first one to go to prison. But yeah. But God won't be silenced. And when we as a church will have that firm foundation... It changes everything. So how are we going to have this direction where we're getting closer to the Bible, emphasizing it more than we ever have before? I mean, think about it. Do you believe biblical literacy is greater today, now in our country, when we spend more money on education and when kids have more access to information than we ever did as kids because of the Internet? Do you think they know the Bible more than we do? They have more resources, better archaeological findings. We have to be a people that goes back to the Bible. One of the things that we need to realize is the church should be devoted to Scripture. This is one of the attributes that we see in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, after that great conversion by Peter and the apostles in Jerusalem, it says this was the follow-up. And it says in Acts 2, 42, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Now think about that. What were they devoted to? What was the first thing that's listed right there that they were devoted to? The apostles' teachings. They were being taught the New Testament. They were being taught 
by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God's word through the apostles. What's it mean to be devoted? I mean, how many of you are devoted to something in your life? And what are you devoted to? Are you devoted to certain things? You know, the, because of, you know, health issues, I decided this last month to change my diet. I went a whole month without eating sugar. Wow. Yeah, very good. Um, and, and I, you know, I lost a few pounds, lost a few inches. Blood pressure has gone down, a lot of different things. I was devoted to that. But what if we devoted even more to our spiritual health by focusing on the thing that can transform not just our bodies, but our hearts? And that's where we have to understand it. this is more than just a physical thing, it's a spiritual thing. And this is what, what can spiritually change my heart? God's Word. The very words of the Holy Spirit like we covered last week. One of the things that we also see here is uh, Paul kind of mentions the importance of devoting ourselves to the public reading of Scripture. We'll read that in a moment. But he also emphasizes doctrine, and I want to get into that in a moment. But in 1 Timothy 4, 11 through 16, it says this, Command to teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching, and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift which was given you through the prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Here's the thing. We are to be devoted to the public reading of Scripture. Teaching and preaching is a big thing because we're not citing man's opinion. We're citing God's holy word. And one of the things that we're hearing more and more of is saying, it doesn't matter what people believe as long as they just say Jesus. It doesn't matter what people teach as long as they just say Jesus. I'm all for Jesus, 100%. But I also acknowledge he's the author of life. He's the Lord of lords and he's the King of kings, which gives him the right and, and he has the character to tell us what we actually need for our own spiritual lives. And one of the things that we have to get back to is we need to realize doctrine matters. Because right here, what did Paul say? It'll save who? Yourself and who? Your hearers. That would include your kids, your grandkids, the guy sitting next to you, the female sitting next to you. Because we're not saved by our own words. We're saved by the words of Jesus because he has the words of eternal life. We don't believe these things to be militant. We believe these things because Jesus said they are true and we know they are true. And because we love him, we accept them. And so we have to be devoted. What if we were all devoted to reading God's word more? Not out of an obligation, not to fill out a checklist, not because we want to be as good as the other people at church or because we should, but because we want to say, God... I'm devoted to your word because I'm first devoted to you. I love you. I, I, want, an, I want an everyday date with Jesus. I want an everyday day conversation with Jesus. I want to know him on a daily basis differently than I did yesterday. I want to know him more. And when knowing him more is the very thing that transforms my life. So we need to be devoted. Another thing is, the church ought to have a biblical attitude towards Scripture. Did you know, over the years, you'd be amazed at how honest people are to ministers. And I actually tell people, I'd rather you be honest with me, even when it's not popular, or even if it kind of makes you look bad, so that we can help you grow. And one of the things that people have often said was, I don't like reading the Bible because then I'm held accountable to it. Do you know how many times I've been told that, even by Christians? And I tell them, well, you may be more accountable because you're knowledgeable of it, but you're still accountable whether you know it or not. Ignorance is not a freedom from, from not being accountable. If you didn't know what the speed limit is and you're speeding out there, guess what? A police officer can still tag you with a ticket. But what if we had a change of attitude? What if we just didn't say, I want to know more for the sake of knowing more? That's not the purpose of reading your Bible, okay? 
It's not, that's not the main reason. We want to know more because we want a relationship with Jesus. But what if we sought out truth? What if we sought out truth because we're tired of being lied by Satan? We're tired of living our life our way, which has not worked so far. What if we changed and we said, I want to know what God thinks because that's the only opinion that really matters. And when we start understanding that and we start having that attitude, it changes things. What, what's your character like right now? You know, Paul commends a certain people because of their evaluation of Scripture. In Acts 17, verse 10 through 12, it says this, As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the Scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. Now why were these people why were the Bereans of more noble character? Because they were searching what? Scriptures. They weren't just knowing for the sake of knowing. They wanted to know the truth. And look at one of, one of the things I really appreciated this morning. Um, Randy has done a great job teaching, and Walt did a good job teaching this morning. And one of the things Walt said that is 100% true is he says, you know what, if you don't know something, study it till you do. And I love that comment by Walt. What Walt's saying is be a Berean. Have the attitude that says, I want to know Jesus. I want to know truth. I want to know what is right so that I can live in a way that brings glory and pleasure to the one who created and saved us. If that's your attitude, that changes everything. Do we as a church have the character and the attitude that says, I'm ready and willing to study God's word deeper than I have ever studied before. I have the character, and I have the desire, I have the passion, first and foremost, because I want to know the truth of Jesus Christ. I want to know him more than I ever have. We know a lot of the facts about worldly things. If I asked you, how many of you read an internet article, and on what? How much did we spend? You know, we've gotten to the point where spiritually in the church, that we, we get to the point where we're like, just please, just read your Bible two more minutes a day. Just read, just read three minutes. And I'm just thinking, why are we telling people this? We watch a movie for an hour and a half, and we have no problem. And I'm thinking, why can't we just spend a little bit more time wanting Jesus? And when we have that character and attitude, it changes our hearts. People are not satisfied with who they are. They're not satisfied with how their life is. And so one of my first questions is, how much time are you spending with God? And I'm not saying this as a criticism. I'm saying it as the solution. Because He changes your perspective. He changes your heart. He changes his, your philosophy of life. And when we start studying Him, that's how we can know. You know, Clint, Clint did a good job in communion. And he said that Jesus, and he read First Peter, and he said that Christ set us an example. How many of us even know what his example is? How can we follow an example of whom we don't know? We have to know God's word. Because that's how we know Jesus. And another thing is the church needs to obey scripture. You know, a lot of churches are really cowardly to start going in this. And we get into the point where we've gotten, not, not, I'm not saying it's in a row, but in, in the church universal, we've gotten to the point where we, don't, we, we make it appear, or we make certain comments where we make it sound like Scripture is optional. Obedience is optional. And we even take that truth. And one of the main things that's kind of plagued the culture for years is this idea of moral relativism. Relativism. You know what that is, right? What's right for you is right for you. What's right for me is right for me. We've even taken this into the church setting. What's right for that church is right for that church, and what's right for this church is right for this church. False. And the reason for this is God's truth is not relative. It's the absolute standard that He has established in order for us to know that we are saved, to know that we can follow Jesus, we have to, one of the things that Paul does is he, is he makes known that he teaches the same thing 
everywhere he went. I want us to look at that in a moment. And in fact, the Apostle Paul commands teaching what he taught everywhere. Now, why would he do that? Why isn't it right for them over there and why right for us over here? Well, if everything should always just go back to Jesus and his word, that should just be an, an obvious. And one of the things that Paul is going to do here, and we're going to look at a few different passages, is we're going to see that Paul wanted what he taught, taught everywhere, but he also wanted them to make a distinction that what he has taught, he wants people to know the words and the teachings and the traditions of God. Now, we hear the word tradition and we think, that's bad. We automatically assume, that's bad. No, in the Bible, there's God's traditions and there's man's traditions. And we should fully teach God's traditions. Traditions in the biblical sense simply means, in the original language, to be passed on. That's all it means. So this is what it means. God has passed on what he wants his church to know through the years. Man's traditions are what we originated and then we pass that on. But the church needs to obey Scripture. And look at what Paul says. We're going to read a few different passages. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 through 17, it says this. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through the sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel. See, two points talking about God's word. So that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Do you see what, what Paul is saying here? He's saying, hold to the traditions that, that he and the other apostles were teaching. Because what they had received first came from the Lord. What they're passing on didn't originate with the apostles. It originated from the throne of heaven. And so he's wanting them to hold firm to the traditions and the teachings and the doctrines of God. Another thing that we see here is that Paul didn't just have his letters read in one church and say, this is only meant for you. He wanted this truth mentioned in Colossians 4, 16, and it says, And when you read this letter has been read to you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and see that they also read the letter from Laodicea. So one of the things that we see here is, after the Colossians read their letter, they're supposed to pass it on. And in fact, we understand in church history, one of the things that the churches did in the first century is when they received a copy of a letter from an apostle, some people would transcribe it and then they would take that letter and they would pass it on to the other churches. So all the churches had the circulation of the New Testament around because Paul wanted the truth of what he taught everywhere. And we see this also, look at what Paul said here in 1 Corinthians 4.17. He says, That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. He's teaching the same message in every church and every place. His truth isn't relative. It's firm. And that's what we should be standing on. And in 1 Corinthians 11, 1 through 2, we see once again, Paul's making this point. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. Do you see what Paul's consistent message is? He's trying to pass on what has been first passed on from God to him and the apostles onto the church. Now, when we hear God's truth, do we obey it? Do we accept it? Or do we just do what's popular? Because what is taught here should be done everywhere in every church. You know, one of the things that's, and we're talking about truth here, and one of the things that's interesting is there's a, and a lot of religious groups, for instance, will take votes on moral issues. There was a big religious um, uprising recently in the news because they were having a conference and they were going to vote on a moral issue. And in fact, they said no matter how it was decided, it was going to be divided. And, you know, first of all, I'm thinking, why are you taking votes on what's moral? Just read your Bible. That's the first thing I would do. 
But the second thing was the group actually barely, but did vote in the right way <laughs> if they were going to have to take a vote. And then I'm just thinking, when did we get to the point where we, we vote on which parts of the Bible we accept and what parts that we don't, what parts we obey, what parts that we don't? Isn't God ruler of all things? Isn't Jesus Lord of lords? As Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, but not do what I say? Luke chapter 6. And remember, Jesus doesn't make worthless commands. There's not one word in the Bible that ha lacks a purpose. And do you know what the interesting thing is? Every word in that book is purposed for you. God's perfect. He doesn't need the commands. The commands were designed for us to live the life God purposed us to have. So if you're tired of living the life you've been living, then ask yourself, how much time have I been spending with God? Do I know Him? Am I following His example? Am I obeying His commandments? Because that's the best thing for my life. God is not a tyrannical God. He's a compassionate God. And that's why His Word is meant to bless our lives rather than do us harm. And if we look at the future, like I said, the Word of God is stronger than any weapon, stronger than any law, stronger than any culture or media outlet. And when the church will finally realize that power and speak with truth and grace and boldness His Word and is willing to live by it, that's when things will change. So church, we have already covered the last few weeks about God's relationship to the Bible. The Father's relationship, the Son's relationship, and the Holy Spirit's relationship. And today we covered our relationship with the Bible. So let's be devoted. Let's change our attitudes. And let's obey. Because we know the Word of God is good. Because our God is good. Let's rise up and be a good church in obedience and love and grace to Him as we now rise and sing. And if today you want to give your life to Christ, we give you the opportunity as well. No tears in heaven, no, 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 no